All right, how's it going, everybody? So, y'all, the robots are coming. We know the robots are coming, but are they coming for us humans, the humans in HR? Will they displace the people behind the very name of human resources? I think actually they will be coming, but it won't be as bad as we think, and there will be some advantages. But first, let's take a step back. Here is 100 years of HR history in about 30 seconds. So we started with a guy named Frederick Taylor who had this concept of the principles of scientific management, which is basically the idea that you could take every individual movement that somebody does, in his case steel workers, and optimize them even better. After some time, this moved to the concept of uh, personnel. And this was kind of the, the dark ages of HR where, where humans were basically files to be moved around, large groups of masses to be put here and there. But eventually we figured out there's humans and human resources. We rebranded ourselves. We started to do things like training and development, leadership, organizational planning, and things got better. Uh, during this time also statistics got better and we started to do things like factor analysis and structural equation modeling, and ultimately things like machine learning and big data. And this brings us to the 2000s. And for me, about 2004, when I started at a little internet startup called Google, which was a great place to be if you were kind of a data nerd like I was and wanted to bring kind of analytical rigor to the HR process. So Google at the time was filled with executives, lots of data, and lots of questions that they wanted kind of data-driven answers to. It was a great place to kind of start what started there, which was kind of this concept of people analytics. And you can find lots of different definitions of people analytics out there, and you can do your own research. But essentially, for me, at, back in 2004, what this meant was taking data, adding insights, and getting better people decisions out of this. So I've since moved on from Google and gone to other places and also been on the other side of it, which is how do people interpret that data. But people analytics has taken off as a field. This is a graph of all this, the search term for people analytics in Google over the last 14 years. And you can see it's up and to the right. This is a concept that we are seeing a lot of uptick on. So, what can you do in this kind of field? You can, turns out you can do all sorts of interesting things. For example, if you have 300 different things you might know about somebody that are like we call predictor variable, so where you went to school, but maybe where you worked, but also how job hoppy were you? What things were you into as a kid? What hobbies do you have? How many of these things will actually predict performance once you actually get there? So uh, performance variables like your first performance score on the job, or even altruistic behaviors, how much you help other people at work. So when you throw all these into interesting um, analyses, you find out that most of them actually aren't that predictive, but you do find some gems in there. So for example, I was able to find things like the age at which you got into computers compared to your peers was a really good predictor of whether you were a good software engineer later on in life. And also found things like people who are highly neurotic make better product managers. <laughs> Draw your own conclusions on that one. <clears throat> You can also do something like the fabulously named Cox Proportional Hazards Model for Survival Time. So in this analysis, picture two people, blue line person, green line person, where you can measure them over time. Time is on the x-axis, and you want to measure their happiness, which is on the y-axis. So I have a theory that your happiest day on the job is your, your first day on the job, because you're just excited to be there, you don't know any better, and then your happiness kind of trails down over time. <laughs> and I know that sounds depressing, but uh, it turns out the data kind of supports that a little bit. But what happens is your happiness doesn't trail off at a steady state rate. It goes in drops, big drops. And in our field, we call those drops organizational shocks. And those shocks can be, these are some of the shocks that I found in the research. If you go from a top tier manager to a terrible manager, that's a huge shock. And your happiness will drop down as soon as you find out that that's the case. If you're reorged for the third friggin' time, you will be less happy on that third time. So you have these things that happen to you. And for, as HR professionals, if we can get ourselves in there and insert ourselves before that shock happens, we can prevent some of the, uh, the decrease in happiness. And it turns out if you get these things, it's way more predictive of whether someone will leave than if you ask people, are you considering leaving? People are not actually that good at, at telling you that, even a year from now. So you can do all these cool things. You can get all this cool data, and you want to have these happy employees, have all these happy jumping people that are there. The issue is you have the boss in the middle, the decision maker, the executive, and some of the fidelity or the power of that analysis gets degraded as you go through 
the, West, the messy, sometimes well-meaning, sometimes slightly clueless person in the middle. So you know, why is that the case? So I, I found there's a couple reasons why I, I think this happens. The first is that your intuition, you feel like it's way more important than the data you're shown. So if you ask somebody, I want you to interview somebody, but I'm gonna give you a bunch of questions and you have to stay to this structured script and answer that, everyone's like, nah, don't do that. Just give me five minutes with this person, I will tell you if we need to hire them. And it's a little bit like being told, um, that's great you signed up for Match.com, you don't have to go meet the person at a bar, just go to the chapel, the algorithm is so good it will tell you, show up there, this is the person you need to marry. People don't like that, they want their intuition in there. And speaking of intuition, it's, it's one example of all these biases and heuristics that we all have that we bring to the table that are really hard to ignore. So from halo to horn, similar to me bias, confirmation bias, we come with all this stuff. And even if we know that it's there, it's really hard to not have it be there. And the third is we want an easy answer. We want a, a top three list, right? We just, just give it to me in top three things. The issue is the robots are still coming. AI is still here, machine learning is here, so we need to find a way to prepare for this. So what I think we need to do is, as HR professionals, we need to act as the Rosetta Stone. We need to have this data that's here, we need to have people that can interpret it um, and, and make it sing for our executives because they're busy and they're mostly well-meaning and they just have 5,000 other things they need to do and you need to help draw that out from them. There's a couple of other things I think that will help along the way. The first is we need to clean up our people data. And in a Deloitte study last year, it was found that 69% of organizations are preparing their data for better people analytics, which is a great start. But if you talk to any of the social scientists within your organizations, they'll say, we got a long way to go. There's a lot more stuff we can get. We need better attrition data, better performance data, a lot more stuff. Second is we need to upskill ourselves as HR professionals. We need to bring social scientists on, people with training in, in stats who can make this, again, this data sing, interpret this for me, how does this work? And the third is we need to pass some of these repetitive tasks that we actually don't really want to do onto the chatbots, onto machine learning, onto AI. So you know, what are some of those things? So there are now 500 million people on LinkedIn, half a billion people, and you don't want to just give that data set to human recruiters who are going to go through this very slowly, one at a time, even if they can write some basic code. You should be able to train algorithms to find subsets of people in LinkedIn to do that better. The second is scheduling and, uh, phone screens and even conducting some of those phone screens. So it, it breaks my heart a little time every time I see recruiting coordinators trade emails 20 times back and forth just to set up one phone screen for then an, a recruiter to then ask the same 10 questions they're asking of all these other people. We can train actually virtual humans to do this for us so that we're not wasting that, that time. And the third is answering FAQs. So these are the kind of thing most HR people don't want to do. When is open enrollment? How do I sign up for my 401k? Where is the employee handbook? Like, talk to the chatbot. That person will figure that out. So the good news is the robots can't do everything. Machine learning can't fix everything. And there's lots of things that you would never, ever send a robot to do. For example, let's say you're asked to investigate why is the experience in your tech company different for women or people of color than it is for white tech bros? You're not sending a robot in to figure that one out. That's super nuanced, right? Or let's say you were uh, worried that there's an employee there who's been stealing a few pennies from thousands of customer accounts over many years, and the press is about to find out about it. That's a tough one for an algorithm. Or you're given uh, 100 leaders, and you have to figure out who are the best 10% that you need to give extra compensation for, and you have five days to do it. So these are actually three challenges I've been asked to do that I can't ever imagine giving a robot to do. So I just kind of want to end with how we can blend all this together. How can we be an AI, a data-driven, AI-enabled HR function and what this could look like for the end user? So picture yourself as an employee in Columbus, Ohio. This is probably a, a live image of Columbus here uh, on the snow. And you're, you're fairly happy in your organization there. But you know, you'd be open to other opportunities. So you flick your little thing in LinkedIn that says you're open to new opportunities and that alerts something that's been crawling through LinkedIn that's been keeping an eye on your profile that now goes, I think this person will be ready. And that sends them a message to see if they would like to trade a few messages back and forth to see if they'd be interested in your company, which is a gaming company in California where it's 72 and sunny and 
the and to see if they'd like to do that. And the, the algorithm figures out that they're going to send this note when the temperature differential is the highest between where you are and where you're going, right? These are all things you can code into this. And we know things like actually people who are more responsive to LinkedIn in mills, I think it's a Tuesday morning. So you could even pick the time to optimize the chances that this candidate will be more interested. So you trade emails back and forth, and um, at the end of this, you have a conversation with a virtual human that asks you basic questions about yourself. How much are you looking? What are your salary expectations? Um, what do you want to do you know, when you grow up? And it can record all this stuff and score this, and if you score high enough, it alerts a human recruiter who gets in touch with you, and eventually you fly out. You fly out, you, and you get the job, and you start in the job, but it turns out your manager's not so good. And so you go talk to your human HR person and say, I'm not liking my, my manager that much. That human has a nice conversation with you, codes that into a database which identifies a trend with this particular manager, that they are not nice to multiple people. That person can then get sent a nudge email for training that's being given by real humans. So this is kind of the world that I'm, I'm thinking we're moving towards, where it's a combination of real live humans, big data, and AI working together to enhance the experience. So I'll, I'll end with a quote from Frederick Taylor, who we kind of started this with, who said, in the past, the man has been most important. In the future, the system must be most important. So in this case, I think the system is the humans, the big data, and AI to make all of work better for all of us humans. Thank you.